Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So today we're going to look at the weapons of the medieval knight. What weapons did medieval knights use? Before we look directly at the weapons, what was a knight? Well, quite simply, a knight was a soldier who rode a horse. And obviously it has lots of other connotations as well with chivalry and their position in society. But ultimately, um, a knight is someone who serves the king or the ruler of the day and who operates principally as cavalry, principally on horseback. We can see this if we look at German, the word Ritter, which means knight, uh, comes from a rider. And if we look at French, for example, Chevalier um, is related to the word for horses, a rider of horses. Their origin probably we could stem back to um, the late Roman period and the use of certain types of um, armoured cavalry. But really, I feel that uh, we need to look at the sort of um, the so-called Dark Ages or the early medieval period. If we look at things like Charlemagne's uh, mounted knights, essentially, uh, then this we could say really this sort of period, this sort of Frankish period, is probably what we could describe as the origin of what we've come to know as the medieval knight. So their defining feature is that they wear armour and they ride a horse. And of course, they use weapons. But what weapons do they use? Well, obviously, the weapons that they choose to use was dictated to a very large extent by the fact that throughout the history of the knight, they rode horses and they wore armour of various kinds. In the earlier periods, what armour was there? Well, quite simply, mail shirts, commonly known as chainmail, and helmets of various kinds. As time went on, this armour was supplemented by things like gambeson, so padded armour, underneath the mail, making the chainmail even more effective. Um, and eventually, of course, plates started to be added and the development of the plate harness or suit of armour, the plate armour, um, that we see arising in the 14th century really comes about. What's interesting is the two core weapons of the knight don't really change from the so-called Dark Ages or Charlemagne's time, the, the time of the Carolingians, right the way through to the end of the knight's existence on the battlefield. And those two weapons are the lance and the sword. Principally a one-handed sword, um, because that was the most convenient to wear and use from horseback. The other hand using a shield and holding reins usually at the same time. Very occasionally, um, longer handled, longer gripped swords were used, but they were at most what we would call a long sword. They were rarely uh, true two-handed swords, which would be used more on foot, of course. Um, so one-handed swords principally were used throughout this entire period for a thousand years. And the lance was really the primary weapon. So the sword was the backup to the lance. Why do you need a lance and a sword? Well, you don't necessarily need both. There have been cavalry across history who sometimes used only a lance and some that have used only a sword. But having both of them gives you a lot of tactical options. The lance, of course, is a very, very effective weapon on horseback. It gives you the longest reach. It enables you to reach people fighting on the ground. It even enables you to reach people um, up on walls and things like this. It enables you to hit the opponent, hopefully, before they can hit you. So it gives you long reach and an extraordinary amount of penetrative power that will go through most types of armour until we really get into the uh, sort of plate armour era. So if the lance is so good, why do you need the sword? Well, quite simply, the lance is very good when you're on the move, on the run. If your horse slowed down and you get into a melee or a close-in fight, then at that situation, a sword is likely to be a far better weapon. Additionally to that, the lance itself can get stuck and can get broken or can get lost indeed. So having a backup weapon is always a good idea. So throughout the first half, or we could really say throughout the entire period of the knight's existence on the battlefield, the lance and the sword were his two primary weapons. However, there were other weapons as well. Now, what were they and why did they come about? Another incredibly important weapon of the medieval knight was the dagger. Yet surprisingly, the dagger, which seems like a common backup or utilitarian item in its origin, actually only really became a regular part of knightly equipment in around the 12th century. And by the 13th century, we start to see daggers worn at the side of knights, or people who we might call knights, relatively often and being used by them in medieval art. 
Now, why might this have been the case? Well, I think it's probably part of the equation that armour played a part and that overcoming armour in very close combat, in essentially wrestling, the dagger became an increasingly important item. And we see this definitely the case as we get into the 14th century with the growing amount of plate armour being around. Often the only way that a knight could overcome his opponent in close combat was actually to close and grapple and use a dagger to get into the gaps between the armour. These daggers came in many forms, from basilards to so-called bollock daggers, through to rondel daggers, which you could say were the most specialised knightly armoured fighting dagger. And these were commonly seen worn on the side of the knight's belt, uh, in balancing up or kind of paralleled with the sword. And so really this three weapon system of the lance, the sword and the dagger became the standard knightly equipment for quite some time until really the end of the knightly period. I want to just briefly mention the shield of course. Many of you will be thinking why hasn't he mentioned the shield yet? Well, quite simply, yes, the shield was absolutely important for most of the period of the knight's existence. If you're using either a lance or a one-handed sword, then of course having a shield in the other hand is incredibly important against um, missile weapons, so arrows and slings, things like this. But additionally, also very, very useful in defending yourself while you're attacking with the weapon. Um, shields did, shall we say, fall out of favour somewhat or slightly as plate armour became good enough that it wasn't always necessary to carry a shield, but they never truly disappeared. And we do see shields in use throughout the period of the knight's existence. The weapon that I'm going to mention, which might surprise some people, um, and this is going chronologically, is that actually if we look at Charlemagne's cavalry, there was one thing that they were often armed with, which a lot of people don't necessarily realise that Carolingian or Charlemagne period cavalry were armed with, and that was bows. And the bow is a weapon that is not often associated with knights, and you could argue it's not a knightly weapon. But nevertheless, Charlemagne found that it was of tactical use to equip his cavalry, who we could say in many ways were the earliest knights in Europe, with bows against certain opponents. If they were coming up against Moors or if they were coming up against Avars, then they did find that for the knights to have the ability to either shoot back against opponents that were shooting at them, or indeed to deploy as archers against fortifications or ships, for example, then this gave them another tactical option. So indeed, the bow, in some ways, was one of the earliest additional weapons that was given to a group of people who we could term as knights. The next weapons that we really see in the hands of knights, or people that we could call knights, are maces and axes. Now maces and axes obviously have their origin way, way back in time. Uh, axes have been around since the Stone Age, and uh, you could say st uh, maces have as well, actually, probably even before that made of wood. Um, but they had been weapons that had been around throughout the Bronze Age and Iron Age, and indeed, they found a use again in the period of knights. Now, why was this? Well, firstly, you can make an axe or a mace one-handed, so you can still use it from horseback, but it has greater impact force. Now, why might that be useful? Well, quite simply, swords are fantastic for wearing at your side. Um, they're very convenient to put in a scabbard. They're relatively light, nimble and quick weapons. They're very useful but they're not great against armour. Now, the great thing about an axe or a mace is it means that you can hit either an armoured or an unarmoured person and still do a fair amount of damage because they are quite top heavy. They're not so convenient to wear and carry and for that reason, they were never as popular as swords in terms of backup weapons, but nevertheless, in the period when we see the majority of um, knights or fighting people start to be armoured, in this case in mail or chainmail armour with helmets, then we do start to see the increasing use of different types of mace and axe so that with one hit you stand a better chance of doing something to take the opponent out of the fight. With time other weapons such as the warhammer came along as well. And uh, this obviously offers different options. You've got the, the pick side that you can penetrate through armour into gaps in, in the plate armour period, sometimes even going through thinner plates. And you've got the hammer face, which you can use pretty much like a mace. But we should also reiterate that the primary weapons of the knight throughout this period remained the lance and the sword. The sword being the backup, the lance being the primary weapon. In the 13th century, we start to see the development of iron or steel plate armour. 
Principally, this started out as something we call a coat of plates, which is a series of plates riveted or otherwise attached to the inside of a garment and worn over the torso. This obviously hugely increases your resistance against weapon penetration into your um, torso. And with time, um, in the 14th century, um, well, in the end of the 13th century as well, we start to see the introduction of plates on certain parts of the arms, and obviously this developed more and more and more until we end up with the full plate harness. This very comprehensive system of armour obviously had an effect on the weapons used, and yet, strangely, probably not as big an effect as you might assume. The lance and the sword continued to be the principal weapons of the medieval knight. We could argue that lances um, developed certain different types, they got a bit heavier in some cases, and indeed swords developed to be better suited to fighting armoured opponents. They went from broader slashing type blades to narrower, pointier, stiffer blades that could be uh, jammed through mail armour and into gaps between plates and things like this. So while the lance and sword did develop um, to counter the armour as, as the armour got better, they still remained the principal two weapons of the medieval knight. And what happens to the maces, the warhammers and the axes? Well, they stayed around as well. They were still very useful weapons against plate armoured opponents. And also remember that the medieval knight wasn't only fighting other medieval knights. Obviously, the greatest number of opponents on the battlefield were not actually other knights. They were common soldiers, many of whom either had very low levels of armour, in some cases no armour, um, but certainly uh, they were armoured in a way that the typical swords, axes, maces, warhammers were still very effective against them. This being said, the axes, maces and warhammers did develop somewhat. Uh, they did evolve to become a little bit more effective against the armour of the day, um, and indeed they just evolved over time to give you more tactical options. For example, points being added on the tops of axes so that you could thrust with them as well as cut with them. Now there was one important change brought about by the introduction of plate armour, and that was that many knights ceased carrying shields on the battlefield. They didn't see them as necessary anymore. Now having a left arm, a left hand free, meant that they started to increasingly use two-handed weapons when fighting on foot. And what we start to see, probably really in the 14th century, is a divergence between the weapons that a knight would carry mounted compared to what they would carry when fighting on foot. And indeed, some countries, most famously the English, often deployed their knights or men-at-arms, because not all of them were knighted, um, they often deployed these knights on foot to fight on foot alongside people like the archers, which meant that they started adopting more specialised foot fighting weapons. So what weapons did the knight fighting on foot in the 14th and 15th century adopt instead of the lance? Well, Actually, ironically, one of the most popular weapons was the lance, used as a spear. And we read about um, lances actually, lances themselves being shortened to be used on foot during the Hundred Years' War. Um, and of course, the spear throughout history has been the most popular, the most successful weapon used on foot by soldiers, with the exception of missile weapons. So we could say, really, that on foot or mounted, the lance or spear remained the most important and popular weapon amongst knights. But there were other popular weapons used on foot as well in, uh, by fully armoured knights. What were they? Well, probably the two most important weapons to mention are the two-handed sword and the poleaxe. Various types of long sword, so in other words, swords which were better suited to holding in two hands, but they weren't enormous. You could still wear them on your side, so they could still be a backup weapon. You could still use them from horseback, uh, and they were more convenient to wear around and to carry uh, than a true two-handed sword. These types of long swords certainly became more and more popular after about 1360, and this almost certainly is connected to the rise of plate armour and the general abandonment of shields by a lot of knights, if not all of them. The pole axe, you could say, was a development really of the Dane axe that we see on the Bayer Tapestry. And fighting on foot, a long-handled axe offers a lot of advantages. It gives you the reach of uh, something approaching a short spear, um, but it gives you the, an enormous amount of cleaving power as well. 
And what we see as we go uh, through the centuries, through the 12th, 13th, 14th century, is that various elements were added to these axes other than beyond the simple Dane axe. So one of the first things to be added was a spike or hammer to the rear, and then we see a spike on the top. And finally, the pole axe developed into a very specialized knightly foot combat weapon. And in fact, there are treatises, there are manuals written about its use, and it was considered as technical as the, the sword, for example. These specialized pole axes from the 15th and 16th centuries have a vast array of tactical options on them, including different types of blades and hammer and spike and top spike and bottom spike, um, and even sometimes disc guards on the shaft. So to conclude, the knight fundamentally was a mounted soldier in their inception. However, they did often fight on foot throughout their existence, and sometimes they performed surprising roles, sometimes operating um, missile weapons such as bows and crossbows, even firearms and often fighting on foot with specialised foot fighting weapons such as pole axes or glaives. However, fundamentally they were a mounted class of soldier and therefore their primary weapons remained throughout their whole existence, the lance and the sword. Thanks for watching, give us a like and a subscribe and we'll see you really soon on Scholar Gladiatoria channel for another video. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!